79-year-old Joe Roy McMillan of Carthage, Texas, disappeared on May 21, 2020. The last known sighting of him was at Ted's Saw Shop on FM 1970 near Clayton, Texas. During the course of the investigation, multiple pieces of surveillance footage, mainly from cameras at gas stations, were found of Joe's blue 2004 GMC Sierra, mainly of it driving south on Route 59. The last sighting of him caught on tape placed him in Livingston, Texas, more than 100 miles south of his home in Carthage. Authorities speculated that Joe may have been driving towards the Houston area because he had family there. This unplanned trip may also have been due to complications from a health condition. Joe was diabetic, and his family also feared that he was beginning to show signs of dementia. On August 6, 2020, authorities in Brazoria County, Texas, were working in a bayou near the town of Freeport to remove two vehicles from the water. The site was just after a sharp turn in a nearby road, and accidents were common there. While they were there to retrieve two vehicles known to have gone off the road and into the water the night before, they unexpectedly found a third vehicle, a blue 2004 GMC Sierra. Joe's remains were inside of the vehicle. While the circumstances of the vehicle's discovery indicated that Joe was killed after his car accidentally went off the road and into the water, the Texas Rangers still processed the scene. No signs of foul play were found. Joe was laid to rest during a private funeral service. He is survived by his wife of 60 years, Bonnie Sue, three children, three grandchildren, and a great-granddaughter. We are saddened by the confirmation, but at the same time, we're just glad to finally have some answers and to get some closure for all that has happened, Joe's grandson, Michael McMillan, told KLTV. Rochelle Thomas Stubblefield was a gifted athlete, attending Calumet College of St. Joseph in Whiting, Indiana, on a track and field scholarship. She had to take a step back from running in 2015, when she became pregnant. She was expecting a boy, whom she planned to name Amir Deshaun Thomas Stubblefield. Her due date, December 15th, was just 10 days before her own birthday, on Christmas Day. In 2015, she would have turned 21. November 10th, 2015, started out as a normal day for Rochelle. She went to her classes and then attended a women's basketball game in the evening. The game was the last place she was seen. When her family stopped hearing from her, they reported her missing on November 12th. After Rochelle disappeared, some of her friends reported to police that she had been planning to go to Gary, Indiana to visit the father of her unborn son. It does appear that Rochelle made it to Gary, as her car was found abandoned in the 1800 block of Martin Luther King Drive there, and her shoes and broken eyeglasses were found in the same area. By 2020, authorities were confident enough that the man Rochelle was going to see was involved in her disappearance to arrest him. 25-year-old Deron Fuller was arrested in July of 2020 and charged with one count of obstruction of justice and two counts of murder, one for Rochelle and one for her unborn son. At the time of his arrest, he was a member of the 19th Engineer Battalion at Fort Knox in Kentucky. He had joined the Army in January of 2016, two months after Rochelle's disappearance. After he was taken into custody in Kentucky, he was extradited back to Indiana. While Fuller is charged with murdering Rochelle, her body has not been recovered. Court documents related to Fuller's arrest revealed new information about the investigation into Rochelle's disappearance and seemed to confirm that Fuller was the person of interest in the case who was being investigated, but not publicly discussed, by police in 2015. Fuller was interviewed by authorities in November of 2015 and told them he did not know where Rochelle was, but she had talked to him about going to Atlanta. He denied being her boyfriend or the father of her unborn child. He said he knew Rochelle had told her mother that he was, but that he didn't know why. Ten days after Rochelle was last seen, police in Indiana received a tip from police in Illinois. Two of Fuller's cousins had come forward, claiming that he had confessed to them during a phone call that he had killed a woman who was eight months pregnant with his child. He was afraid of being asked to pay child support, and therefore choked her and stabbed her in her temple. He then buried her body behind Williams Elementary School in Gary. 
Three days later, Fuller was taken into custody at the home of another woman with whom he was romantically involved. When she was interviewed by police, she told them that she had picked Fuller up from the track at Williams Elementary School after he called her and asked for a ride. He told her that something had happened to Rochelle and that he was responsible for it. The grounds of the elementary school were searched with cadaver dogs twice, once in August of 2016 and once in January of 2017. During the second search, the dogs indicated that there were human remains present on a hillside behind the school, but nothing was found when police began digging up the area. In August of 2019, Fuller's girlfriend from 2015 was now his ex-girlfriend, and she was living in Texas. Investigators traveled there to speak to her again, promising her immunity from prosecution in the case. During this interview, she stated that Fuller had been throwing items that belonged to Rochelle out of the car window as they drove away from the elementary school, and that he told her he killed Rochelle by choking her. Fuller's defense attorney has said that he finds it odd that his client was arrested in 2020, when police have not found any new, significant information. Their reasoning will hopefully become clear as the case progresses. Rochelle's body still has not been found. On June 13, 1993, a woman called the property manager for her apartment on Pillsbury Avenue in Minneapolis, Minnesota, to complain that water was leaking into her unit. The manager determined that the water was coming from a certain apartment in the building, but no one answered the door when he went to it. After he let himself in, he found that the source of the water was the shower, which had been left running. He also found a large amount of blood in the nude body of 35-year-old Jeannie Childs. She had been stabbed multiple times. Jeannie was a sex worker who brought clients back to this apartment, which was rented by her boyfriend, who had been out of state at the time of her murder. Her case went cold, but several items were collected from the scene. Eventually, they were tested for DNA. A DNA profile was developed from sperm cells on items from the scene and from two other non-sperm cell fraction samples taken from Jeannie's towel and comforter. This DNA profile was not found in any criminal databases, but in 2018, it was run through a commercial DNA site, and genetic genealogy was used to identify a suspect, who had been living in Minneapolis at the time of the murder. That suspect was placed under surveillance, and in early 2019, authorities followed him to a hockey game. There, they witnessed him eat a hot dog and wipe his mouth with a napkin. When he threw the napkin away, they collected it. The DNA found on the napkin was a match to the DNA from the crime scene. The suspect was 52-year-old Jerry Westrom, a married father of three. He was arrested and charged with second-degree murder in February 2019. A direct DNA sample was then taken from him and confirmed the DNA match. Speaking with police after his arrest, Westrom denied any involvement in Jeannie's murder. He further claimed that he had never even been in that apartment, or that apartment complex. When he was shown a picture of Jeannie, Westrom said he did not recognize her, and claimed that he had not had sex with any woman in Minneapolis in 1993. He could not explain why his DNA was at the scene. He posted bail and was released. Westrom, with the support of his family, maintains his innocence. His lawyer has claimed that the evidence against his client is thin, because some of the DNA came from sperm and the victim was a sex worker. In April of 2019, authorities announced that another piece of evidence tied Westrom to the scene, a bare footprint left in Jeannie's blood, which was a match to Westrom's footprint. Westrom was originally charged with second-degree murder at the time of his 2019 arrest. However, on June 25, 2020, a grand jury indicted him for first-degree premeditated murder in the case. He turned himself in to the Hennepin County Sheriff's Office the following Monday. With the charge increased, a judge also increased his bail to $2 million, up from the $500,000 it had been set at following his initial arrest on the second-degree charge in 2019. He was able to post it and was released on July 16th. At the end of July 2020, Westrom's trial date was finally set for April 19th, 2021. Hearings in the case were originally delayed because the defense was waiting for evidence in the case, which Westrom's lawyer says they are still waiting for. 
proceedings have now been delayed due to the ongoing pandemic. This case only has a minor update, but is being included in this video because it is such a current case. Detrick Foster was a loving father of two daughters, who lived in Independence, Kansas. He did not live in the same town as most of his loved ones. His ex-wife and daughters live in Kansas City, and the majority of his family lives in Parsons, Kansas. He was also in the process of getting a new phone, which resulted in there being a period of a few days where he was out of contact in April of 2020. He remained out of contact beyond those few days, but no one in his family realized that he had been out of contact with all of them until Dedrick failed to make his customary calls to his ex-wife, sister, and mother on Mother's Day. He was then reported missing. The last sighting of Dedrick authorities have been able to confirm occurred on April 12, 2020 in Independence. Since he has been missing, Dedrick has missed the birthdays of both of his daughters, Father's Day, and his and his twin sister's 38th birthday. His disappearance is being investigated by the Kansas Bureau of Investigation and the Independence Police Department. On September 4, 2020, Kansas Governor Laura Kelly signed an executive order offering a $5,000 reward in Dedrick's case. In a September 9th press release announcing the reward, the KBI stated that they and the Independence Police Department are treating the case like a homicide based on the information they have uncovered during the course of their investigation. Due to the ongoing nature of the investigation, they cannot disclose what that information is to the public. Governor Kelly also referred to Detrick's case as a likely murder in her executive order, which also recognized that the investigators have dedicated over 1,000 hours to the investigation and followed up on almost 90 different leads in the case.